This video is sponsored by War Thunder. Check it out via the link in the description. This video is a companion to our two-part series on the history of the Bolsheviks. You can check it out by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. While this video totally works on its own, knowing the history of the Bolsheviks will add useful context. In raw political terms, Marxism-Leninism is the most successful political ideology in history. No other ideology has come from such brutal beginnings, experienced such intense repression, and still managed to rise to dominate so much of the world. And that's all in spite of the fact that it doesn't even work. So the natural question is, how? How did such a stillborn ideology take over so much of the world so quickly? More specifically, how did the Marxist-Leninist Bolsheviks defy their impossible circumstances and found one of the only two superpowers to ever exist? Let's find out. You can call me Ezekiel. And this is why the Bolsheviks succeeded. But before we find out how the Bolsheviks abolished capitalism, let's participate in it. Because this video is sponsored by War Thunder. I'm super happy to have War Thunder sponsor this video, because it's one of my favorite games. In fact, as part of my compensation, I asked for in-game currency, and they said yes! Soon the Merkava will be mine! But why should you play War Thunder? Because it's the best PvP vehicle combat game on the market today. That's why. War Thunder has over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and warships from over a century of history, every one of them lovingly detailed and authentically brought to life, both visually in 4K resolution and in the game's highly realistic damage and ballistic models. The game can be played at any level of realism from the easy-to-learn arcade mode to realistic mode to ultra-hardcore simulation mode. War Thunder is available on PC, Xbox Series S and X, PlayStation 5, and even older consoles. So click our link in the description or pinned comment to start playing War Thunder for free. And get yourself started with a bonus pack including multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, and several boosters. I promise, you're going to love it. And now, back to the video. Before we can understand its success, we need to understand what Marxism-Leninism is and how successful it's been. Marxism-Leninism is a variation on Marxism designed to apply specifically to Russia. This was necessary because Marxism isn't an ideology so much as a method to achieve communism. And key to that method is the belief that a society must undergo industrialization before it can become communist. Marxist-Leninists reject that assumption, and instead believe that a society can be partially, or as they later discovered, not at all industrialized and still become communist. Depending on your definition, there have been up to 50 Marxist-Leninist and derivative states on every inhabited continent, all the result of revolutions, democratic elections, civil wars, and foreign invasions. Yet only four survive to this day, and only in arguably communist forms. So now that we understand what Marxism-Leninism is, and how successful it's been, we can find out how the Bolsheviks did it. There are three key factors that led to the Bolsheviks' success. One, revolutionary politics. Two, class warfare. And three, vanguardism. When trying to implement a new complex system, regardless of whether it's architectural, biological, social, or otherwise, it's far easier to start from scratch than to modify an existing system. This makes any ideology that stands in opposition to an existing order a revolutionary one. Only ideologies that support the existing order, but prefer a different variation of it can consider reformism. The Marxist-Leninist Bolsheviks, living in an autocratic country in a capitalist world, had no choice but to become revolutionaries. Reformism was simply off the table. Revolutionary politics is not a recent development. Even in the classical world of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, revolution was a common occurrence. The Peloponnesian War was not just fought over control of Greece, but also to determine whether the dominant ideology would be democracy or oligarchy. The revolutions described in Thucydides' history were practically identical to those of the modern day. And there can be no doubt that revolutions had already been seen in the world long before Thucydides. Revolutionary politics is impossible with just a small clique. 
A transfer of power to a clique is not a revolution, but a coup. A revolution must involve all elements of a society, and there's only one good way to convince a whole society to participate in a revolution. Class warfare. A class is either a large or small but powerful group of people within a society with shared socioeconomic interests. Each class's social and material conditions heavily impact which ideologies its members will find appealing or appalling. This means that political communication or debate between classes is either difficult or impossible. With each class having fundamentally different values, interests, and objectives, debates between them are more frequently a matter of manipulation than communication. Regardless of whether he's right, how could a capitalist possibly explain to a bureaucrat that taxation is wrong? How could a peasant possibly explain to a noble that feudalism is wrong? The truth inevitably takes a backseat to class interest. In the rare few cases when an individual becomes convinced that his class is immoral, he'll frequently become overtaken by a desire to change into what he perceives is the moral class. When most people think of class warfare, they imagine the conflict between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. In a democratic society, regardless of their values, the proletariat will always look like the hero due to there being more of them. As a result, most liberal democratic ideologies reject class warfare out of hand. But that's a tremendous mistake. Because, as it turns out, there are more than two classes. Some examples of other classes include the rural peasants, who are distinct from the urban proletariat, the petty bourgeoisie, who in modern parlance could roughly be equated to the middle class, the academia, the bureaucrats or mandarins, and the clergy. By the way, those last two classes, the bureaucrats and the clergy, used to be the same class, but separated with the secularization of the state. In the popular imagination, Marxists have a virtual monopoly on class analysis, so let's have some fun and do a non-Marxist class analysis. Both anarchist and statist leftists are primarily interested in the proletariat and the peasants. Interestingly, the divide between anarchists and statists can be seen along class lines. The Marxists explicitly call the proletariat the leader of the peasants. This preference can get pretty extreme though, because when Marxists take power, they almost always start a class war against the peasants. So much for leadership, I guess. Meanwhile, the anarchists favor the peasants, as evidenced by their widespread peasant support during the Russian Civil War. As the Marxists correctly identified, the liberals are an alliance between the capitalists and the petty bourgeoisie, although it should be noted that liberal in this case means anything from hardline conservatism to social democracy. In class terms, the conservatives will usually bring peasants into their bloc, while the more liberal liberals bring in the proletariat. But let's not leave the right out of the fun. Neo-reactionaries should appeal most to the aristocracy who basically don't exist anymore, so I suspect they'd have the most success appealing to the very top of the capitalist class, who want very badly to become entrenched oligarchs. They would also see some success appealing to the military, who frequently harbor dreams of restoring order to a collapsing society. Although it should be noted that the military isn't really a class so much as composed of classes. Meanwhile, the libertarians will have the most success among the most self-sufficient classes. That means the peasants and the petty bourgeoisie. While libertarians love capitalism, they should not fall into the trap of assuming that capitalists love it back. Remember, the capitalists are the people who use the market to displace the last group of elites. They don't want that to happen to them. That's why capitalists are, counterintuitively, anti-market, and always try to get the government to rig it. So now that we understand the classes, we can talk about class consciousness. Just because you're a member of a class doesn't mean you know it. Just as the nation-state cannot form until the nation becomes aware of its existence and interests, a revolution is impossible until a class knows about its existence and interests. This level of awareness is called class consciousness. The revolutionary's job is to inculcate as much class consciousness in their friendly classes as possible. But there's a snag. Even a class living under a hostile system will support that system if the times are good. This means that class consciousness can only begin in the most repressed and outcasted elements of a class, the people for whom times are never good. It's only when the system breaks down and the less depressed elements start to feel the heat that they can develop class consciousness of their own. That's why the revolutionary's credo must always be, the worse things get, the better. 
all of this explains why the Bolsheviks failed in 1905, but succeeded in 1917. The first revolution was stopped when the Tsar realized his mistakes, ended the war with Japan, and extended concessions to the liberals. Meanwhile, the provisional government of 1917 continued fighting and losing the war, alienated its potential allies, and generally made the whole situation worse, all to the benefit of the revolutionaries. So what's supposed to happen when a class becomes sufficiently conscious? The Bolsheviks believed that this would cause the revolution to begin, that the proletariat would use their vast superiority in numbers to overthrow their government and finally implement the communist society. But it's here, once again, where Marx and even Lenin turned out to be wrong, because the October Revolution just didn't happen that way. It cannot be emphasized enough just how incompetent of a fighting force the Soviet Red Guard was. They were barely an armed mob. During the Russian Civil War, the Red Guard disintegrated against all organized resistance, even when they outnumbered it several times over. Had there been resistance on the part of the provisional government, the Red Guard would have been defeated. The Bolsheviks couldn't have overthrown a fruit stand, much less Russian capitalism. But they didn't have to. Because when those bumbling, incompetent, know-nothing militiamen walked into the offices and communication centers of the provisional government, they made a shocking discovery. Because they did not overthrow the provisional government. They discovered that it did not exist. No one in Russia was willing to stand up and defend it. Russian capitalism was not drowned in a proletarian tidal wave. It simply atrophied out of existence. This reveals the true power of class consciousness. Because, now that the existing order has collapsed, the general population will accept the revolutionary's worldview, even when they would not have before. People will say that those crazy radicals were right all along, that this is the fault of the capitalists, or the government, or fiat money, or whatever institution the radicals dislike, and inevitably come around to support the radicals' ideology. It is not the job of the revolutionary to overthrow the regime. It's to make sure that everyone is prepared to blame their preferred enemy when the regime does collapse, and to use their newfound support to rush into the vacuum it leaves behind. Vanguardism is a strategy wherein a small core of radical and tightly coordinated political actors manipulate a political environment to achieve their objectives, the best examples being the leaders of the American Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and to a lesser extent, the French Revolution. While vanguardism may appear similar to populism, equating them would be a mistake. The vanguard manipulates the people into supporting their ideology, while the populist aligns himself with what the masses already believe and leads them. The vanguard has many tactical options available to him, including propaganda, agitation, fake news, censorship, street protest, organized rioting, and pretty much anything else they can think of. Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals is a great, if limited, selection of vanguardist tactics. During the First Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks did a terrible job of being a vanguard. They frequently abandoned leadership positions, failed to take control of events, and overall squandered every opportunity that presented itself. They made certain not to repeat those mistakes during the Second Revolution. There, they filled leadership positions within the Soviets, held back the people when they rose up too soon, and led audaciously when the time was ripe. Bolshevik vanguardism was made even stronger by their determination as well as by a strategy of which Lenin was particularly fond. Flexible tactics, implacable ideology. The Bolsheviks were always prepared to unsentimentally throw away failing tactics and replace them with new ones, but they never changed their core beliefs. They ignored electoralism during the revolution and participated in it during times of stability. They worked with Kerensky to beat Kornilov, and then worked with the Mensheviks to defeat Kerensky, but at no point did they ever seriously compromise their ideology. This closely relates to vanguardism, because only a small elite party can dynamically change its tactics so quickly, but if the vanguard loses its ideology, it just falls apart. There's also something to be said for the Bolsheviks' incredible determination. Seriously, those guys never quit. Nothing. Not Siberian exile, Russian prisons, state executions, foreign exile, or dire poverty could stop them. During their foreign exiles, many Bolsheviks were so poor that they starved, had mental breakdowns, got carted off to asylums, and even committed suicide. And not even that was enough to stop them. If anything, they just worked harder. After the catastrophic July days of the Second Russian Revolution, when it looked like Kerensky had crushed the Bolsheviks, Lenin was quoted as saying to a comrade, 
You, Comrade Solomova, they might arrest. But me, they will hang. And did that stop him? No! Lenin just started plotting an armed uprising, one which the Kornilov affair meant they never had to go through with. The only word for this is inevitabilism. Through its Hegelian influence, Marxism believes in an inevitable course of history, and that among those inevitable events was Marxism's ideological victory. The Marxists acted like it. And that's why the Bolsheviks succeeded. This video was funded by Chinese communists in a quest to return to their Marxist-Leninist roots, including Josiah, and by this video's sponsor, War Thunder. Click our link in the description and pinned comment to start playing War Thunder today, and to get yourself a head start with a free bonus pack, including multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, and several boosters. That's also where you'll find links to where you can support us directly. Like, comment, and subscribe for more. I'll see you in the next one.